Jacques Benveniste seems the epitome of a successful modern French scientist. He has a young second family and a stylish penthouse apartment in the center of Paris. But life changed after he developed a new scientific theory about water. Water, he says, has a memory like magnetic tape. But scientists think the idea is crazy, and he now faces professional ruin. Benveniste, once a respected scientist, is now accused of heresy. But he protests it only happened because of a chance discovery. I've been tagged an heretic. Why? Because I found a, a weird result. Let's, let's say that you just walk on a road and you find something that shines and you pick it up and then here's a diamond, you know, and you go home and say, look, look, I found a diamond on the road. Nobody will laugh at you. That's glass. I mean, wait a minute. You can't find a big diamond like that on the road. Yes, but it is a diamond. And then you are tagged it crazy and so on. So, so. This government laboratory outside Paris belongs to the French equivalent of Britain's Medical Research Council, INSERM. Here, for the last 14 years, Benveniste has headed a 40-strong team of doctors and scientists doing groundbreaking research into allergies. His problems began 10 years ago when one of his teams started research into homeopathy. In the light of later events, he feels the need to declare his original skepticism. My usual joke about this is that the first time I heard the word homeopathy, I thought it was a sexual disease. <laughs> it's going too far because I knew barely what was homeopathy, but I, 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 the most classical MD and the most classical scientist and the most rationalistic person you can find. Homeopathy is a branch of alternative medicine which is widely available in France. But in fact, few doctors prescribe it because its medicines are based on a theory conventional science says is wholly irrational. Homeopaths believe that the more a medicine is diluted, the more effective it becomes. To make their remedies, their drugs are repeatedly diluted in water and shaken in a special way. Often the medicines are so dilute they end up as little more than water. So why on earth did Benveniste think it worth investigating? The story is the, is the following. There was a, an MD in my lab who was doing classical research also. And once he told me that he, he was an homeopathic doctor. And I said, fine. Then he came back and he said, do you mind if I try to dilute uh, some of our reagents and see if they do something on cells? And I remember vividly, that was 1982 or 83, that I told him, OK, look, uh, do it, but this is water. It's going to do nothing. But puzzlingly, the researcher's initial tests showed an effect. So Benveniste put one of his best technicians onto it, Elizabeth Davener. She was skilled in a technique developed by Benveniste himself using an allergen, like this anti-serum, to test people's blood for allergies. Sir Benveniste asked her to dilute the anti-serum in exactly the way homeopaths make their remedies, by successive dilutions in water, interspersed by vigorous shaking. The shaking, say homeopaths, energizes the water. But as at each stage the solution is diluted by a factor of 10, after the second dilution, it's a hundred times weaker, and a billion by the ninth. In fact, above the 20th, there's literally nothing left of the original starting substance. Benveniste then asked for the highest dilutions to be added to the blood samples. If someone's allergic, particular blood cells called basophils will explode or degranulate on contact with an allergen, releasing histamine. 
But now that the allergen had been so highly diluted, Benvenis was sure his top assistant would see nothing. But astonishingly, she recorded almost as many cells degranulated by the homeopathic dilutions as by the original full-strength allergen. The very first thought was that there was an error. But when I got the second set of data, I had the feeling of setting the foot in a completely unknown world, something that, that was so strange that I couldn't even envision what was going on. We know that there is nothing that can make basophil degranulate by themselves. And therefore, if they were degranulating, if they were disappearing, is that something specific happened to them. But this something specific, specific was water, and this was flabbergasting. Unable to ignore such extraordinary results and his natural scientific curiosity aroused, Benveniste ordered an in-depth program of research to get to the bottom of it all. After two or three years of experiments, we reached the conclusion that we could indeed obtain specific biological activity uh, with a trigger that had been diluted billion, billion, billion times, for example. So there was no possibility that any molecule could survive in this solution. Uh, therefore, we had to envision the fact that everything was going on as if water was capable of memorizing the molecule it had seen at the beginning of the dilution. And billions and billions and billions of dilution after, it still knew with some process that it had seen that molecule. And hence was coined the expression the memory of water. Polémique euh, autour d'une découverte faite par un Français, le professeur Benvenis. Qui se... In France, the memory of water became a media sensation. But he wanted recognition from the scientific press, in particular Nature. Nature, published in Britain, is the world's leading science journal. Scientists vie to submit their work to its referees in the hope of publication. They took a dim view of the memory of water, and so did Dr. Maddox, the editor. Benveniste sent us a paper, which seemed to us quite extraordinary. We sent it out to referees. They all said to a man that um, they thought the work was very impressive. They didn't believe a word of it. So Nature asked Benveniste for more evidence. After two years' further work, he sent it in. But Maddox remained highly sceptical because the memory of water seemed to have no physical basis. I thought and thought a lot about it and said, right, we're not going to publish. I wrote and told him that. And he called up very angrily, saying, you're suppressing one of the great discoveries of the 20th century. Now, I forget whether it was then or later that he compared himself to Galileo. And he harangued me again about the importance of the work and uh, the prejudice of journals like Nature against it. And I said, OK, we'll publish on this condition that you let us come to your lab and uh, see what's actually going on. In June 88, Nature finally published Benveniste's findings, but with a hostile editorial saying that if he were right, much of modern science would have to be junked. Nature promised an inquiry. The paper was published to the condition that I would uh, accept that a committee would come to my lab to see the data. And this was perfectly acceptable. Except that when the committee came, I had names that I never heard of in, in science and realized that uh, they were essentially fraud busters, not, not scientists. Benveniste himself filmed the committee's visit. There were three of them, Walter Stewart, a writer on fraud in science, James Randi, a magician who'd investigated Yuri Geller, and Maddox himself, who admits they set out to find fraud. To be frank, um, I had talked uh, this whole Benveniste problem over with some colleagues of mine in America uh, who, who had been concerned with scientific fraud. And uh, they took the view that Benveniste was not a fraud, but it could well be that somebody in his lab was playing a trick on him. 
One of the things you mentioned, Elizabeth, was the number... The nature trio spent days questioning Ben Veniste and his staff. What we found was that his whole team was playing a trick on itself. They very rarely made these measurements blind, which meant that anyone who knew what he was looking for could bias his own counting to get the kind of answer he expected. Now, worse than that, his assistant, a woman called Elizabeth, kept the neatest notebook, but uh, she filled it in only after the experiments were done and didn't enter the experiments that didn't work. But Ben Veniste was equally critical of the committee when they asked to supervise an experiment. They hastily reproduced the experiment, participating themselves in the process, which is completely unheard of. Uh, obviously, they were not expert. And one experiment failed, and then they decided that the whole thing was worthless. That's it. It was a pantomime. They had a code that they called double blind, but it's uh, absolutely not. And they knew the code. I mean, can you imagine that? A stick tumbled up to the, to, to, to the ceiling, and Randy played tricked in the middle of the experiment. Everybody was laughing. And uh, let me sum up the whole thing. It was typical of something that looked like a McCarthy investigative uh, committee, you know, at that time. Uh, it's witch hunt. They, they, were there, they were out to kill. They were never out to, to seek the truth. Nature announced its damning verdict. In France, there was uproar. Benveniste was no longer a media hero, he was a scandal. The memory of water became the Benveniste affair. But the scandal of the memory of water had even wider implications involving the honor of France. It's a disgrace for the French science. What could mean memory of water? For me, I think it's a beautiful poetic expression, and I'm very much impressed by it, insofar as poetry goes. Uh, but when science is concerned, It's no more a poetic line, it's a joke. And for Ben Veniste's colleagues at France's most famous centre of biological research, it was all deeply embarrassing. In the laboratory, the people were horrified. I think that horrified is a proper word. And we are all immunologists. Some of us have worked on uh, uh, histamine releasing factors. They know the system, and they could not believe a word of the paper which, which was published. You know that Benveniste is, uh, is a good scientist, you know, and uh, he is an important member of the INSERM, of the uh, Medical Research Council, French Medical Research Council. And it, there is some sort of a discredit also, which is uh, thrown onto uh, French scientific institutions. The establishment asked for Benveniste's head. The leaders of French science, the noted scientists, the Nobel Prizes and people at Institut Pasteur, Collège de France and uh, Ecole Normale, wanted me to be removed from my position. And if not, at least that I remove this data from my file. And I don't talk about them anymore. I put them, many of them told me, I mean, you were happy as, as you were, put them back in the drawer. I mean, it was a very high pressure on my administration by what I call the Ayatollahs. The Ayatollahs of science ask for my resignation because this was a disgrace for French science. Benveni's bosses at INSERM set up an inquiry. While praising his conventional research, two separate committees condemned his foray into what they considered pseudoscience. Ben Veniste thought his career was finished. These official uh, committees printed and distributed to the general press that I should not be reassigned to my, to my position, which 
amounts to the document that were issued by, by the Communist Party on, uh, on, uh, on the people they wanted to, to put to trial, you know. Except that in this case, it was not uh, meant to kill people, but to kill ideas. <laughs> it's completely impossible to understand. For 95% of my production from my lab, there's no doubt that Jacques Benvenis is a good scientist. But then for that thing that is not possible and therefore should not be, I am crazy, I am mad, I am whatever, I am out of my mind, I am, you know, it's very curious, I don't understand this. But all wasn't lost. Benveniste was reprieved, providing he put a stop to any more publicity about the memory of water. But behind closed doors, the condemned research continued. And Benveniste now had an ally, the director of another INSERM section, statistician Alfred Spira. It was Benveniste's treatment at the hands of the science journal Nature that Spira felt he should redress. I was really surprised and upset uh, after the publication of uh, Benveni's paper in Nature when I read the evaluation which was made by the editor of a journal, a magician uh, and a journalist. And uh, I thought it was uh, not uh, serious enough and uh, it could be dangerous for scientists to be evaluated in, in such a way. So Spira and his staff set up their own test of Benveni's discredited experiments. Again, the solutions of allergen had been homeopathically diluted to the point that they were only water. The statisticians then secretly relabeled all the test tubes using a code known only to them. They also included a set of fake tubes containing nothing but water. Benveni's claims were said to be based on sloppy, even fraudulent science. Could his lab now spot the real dilutions from the fake ones? Well, I was very surprised. We found the, the same results as uh, Jacques Benveniste uh, published in Nature. Uh, there was a difference uh, between active and non-active solutions in, in the basophil counts. And this difference could not be explained by some error or some mistake in the statistical analysis. Everything was blind and there was absolutely no possibility of cheating or uh, of fraud in interpreting the data. Spira's investigation had fully confirmed Benveniste's original findings, but that too no one believed. Philosopher of science Michel Schiff sees parallels with other heretics in history, even Galileo. Galileo told people, go and look in my, in my lenses, and people refused. Well, uh, even if the comparison with Galileo may be a little extreme, basically, I think it is the same phenomenon. It's, uh, it's as if they were afraid to discover something that they didn't like. It's reasonable that people should be skeptical uh, and uh, should uh, demand uh, good proof. But what I think is, is, uh, is not reasonable is to uh, refuse any proof, to act as if whatever proof was produced, it would be disqualified anyway. And this is what the word heresy means. It means there's no discussion possible. But Benveniste battled on. Within a year after his condemnation by nature, he had begun a new series of experiments that were to lead him even more deeply into heresy. He bought a set of standard laboratory apparatus for testing new drugs on animals, using the hearts of humanely killed rats. With this setup, the effects of drugs on the heart can be precisely measured. Benveniste wanted to use it to test his memory of water theory, could a drug, homeopathically diluted to the point that it was only water, behave like the original drug? Astonishingly, Benveni said the results showed it could. We have been working now since um, about three years and we have hundreds of experiments. And they are clearly demonstrative of the fact that we can get a biological activity uh, very successfully uh, with very high dilution. So it's a major pharmacological effect 
obtained with nothing else than water uh, in a dilution. The next obvious question is how water can do it? What are the physical mechanisms behind this possibility, the capability of water to transfer a biological information? Benveniste's next step was a leap even further into the unknown. He put some of the highly dilute drug solutions, which had seemed to show the memory of water effect, into this powerful magnetic coil. He wanted to test his hunch that the memory of water might be electromagnetic. So he used the coil's magnetic fields to erase any possible electromagnetic information in the solution. He then retested that solution. It had no effect on the heart. To Benveniste, that meant water did have an electromagnetic memory system, like a tape recorder. He felt that since scientists hadn't listened to him, he'd go back to the press. It was very, very clear that water was, in fact, a uh, liquid magnetic tape. And if water was doing this job in our test tube, it's because it was doing the job in nature, in your own body, uh, between your own cells, or my cells and my molecules. So it remains that um, we have now practically the, the proof that water is doing this kind of job and that we might have uncovered the, the language of molecules, which is a, a kind of a step forward in science. Convinced of his discovery, Benveniste became obsessed with a new idea. If water was like a magnetic tape, could he record something directly onto it? Like the effects of a powerful heart drug. So now you are about to witness uh, one of the first trials we are doing to attempt to transfer a biological information uh, via an electronic, an electronic device. This is a, what we call a, a mother ampoule, an ampoule mère, uh, which contained a toxin, something which is toxic to the heart. The activity that is emitted by this compound, which is most probably an electromagnetic field, will be picked up by a coil, which is under it, amplified, and about the same way as a telephone receiver will, will send the voice transferred to this coil that will confer the same activity to this uh, water plus salt. Uh, hopefully it will uh, be endowed with the new activity and therefore we hope to show that we are capable of transferring a biological information via an electric uh, system. It was a final desperate bid to obtain what he thought would be clinching evidence for the memory of water. He had now connected up a heart rate monitor so he could watch the progress of the experiment in real time. First, the heart was given just water. Nothing happened. Then, the magnetized water was injected. What is remarkable with this, uh, this data is uh, you can see immediately that this heart is in complete arrhythmia, as if we had injected a toxic compound to this heart. In fact, this heart has been injected with distilled water that has never seen the molecule, has never been in physical contact with the molecule, has only received radio waves, electromagnetic signal, has acquired the full capacity of behaving exactly like the original track. In other words, we show with this experiment that we can if I wanted to be a little pompous, I would say for the first time in the history of mankind, we can transfer an, a biological information 
to a magnetic kind of liquid tape, which is water. This is not surprising to us because we know since um, two years now that what we have done in the high dilutions experiment that were published before is in fact to transfer to water an electromagnetic information. This indicates that biological molecules um, emit specific radio waves and it is via these radio waves that they communicate. He allowed himself to fantasize about the implications. One day, not very long, we are going to get our drugs uh, on the phone. There is no reason why you should, we shouldn't be able to perform this or have uh, a whole pharmacy on a chip uh, on our credit card. But that's maybe going too far. Uh, the first big fight will be to have this data accepted. Within a few weeks of those first pilot experiments, Benveniste broke the news to headquarters. He asked them to witness his extraordinary breakthrough. But nobody came. Eighteen months later, at the end of last year, Benveniste was still experimenting and claiming the same extraordinary results. But still no one from headquarters had come. Few scientists wanted to know, and of those who did, most couldn't believe what they saw. One very noted scientist, a Nobel Prize in physics, came, saw the experiment done blind, and saw a very, very clear-cut uh, result and uh, went out and a few days later he said um, to me that I was either one of the greatest scientists on earth, which is not true, uh, uh, or a fraud. But already Benveni's fate had been sealed. Last year he was told his contract would not be renewed and that his whole lab would be closed down. And in December came the final blow. Nature, the journal that had first attacked Benveniste, published a paper by five British scientists who reported that they had redone Benveniste's original high dilution experiment and it hadn't worked. But Benveniste complained they hadn't done the experiment properly, so the results were invalid. But whatever the truth, as a heretic, he knew few would believe him. His whole career appeared to be at an end. His isolation from the world of science was complete. When I think about the whole episode, I'm constantly asked to myself, what did I do wrong? Maybe I should have thrown the data away. And, you know, so you have your peace of mind. You are not uh, threatened. If I am right or if I am wrong, that's not the problem. The problem is to change the system. As strange as it may sound, science has become unfriendly to new ideas. If we can be, as scientists, stamped heretic, it's because there is a dogma. And the fact that all dogma have been crushed in the past by new ideas, it's not a lesson for these people. We have to, to destroy the system. Okay, it's a